Hello again, this is Stephen K. De Silva at Stephen K. De Silva Ministries. You've checked out another one of my exciting episodes of whatever I want to talk about. Really, what this is, is a message to my community of people that are following my ministries page, uh, De Silva Ministries. And uh, we are just working our way right now through a series on the fact that there is a rising interest rate environment. And this is kind of new for investors because the uh, interest rates for our national bank have been at virtually bottom of the ocean for a number of years. I, I won't hesitate an uh, accidental estimate, but I would say for the past five, probably 10 years, our interest rates have been remarkably low and falling lower. And so we've been talking about why that is and what does it mean that it is now rising and what are the, more importantly, what are the consequences for the fact that they are rising now? So we've been talking about four different debt scenarios uh, because interest rates relate to debt and debt in most households are in the areas of uh, credit cards, home mortgage, equity lines of credit, and car loans. And so we're working our way through those details. If you are interested and you're new today to this broadcast, check out the past four Monday uh, broadcasts and you will find connections to the whole idea uh, of this theme throughout the other three loans. But today, we're going to talk really only about the idea of car loans and the specifically the subject of, is it smarter to lease or buy a vehicle? Now, culturally, this is a new, really a new revived conversation because historically in the past, it was almost always cheaper to buy a car and the reason is because the interest rates embedded underneath a lease that are hidden costs, they're hidden in the calculation, uh, really were very high. And so because those rates were high and car loans were relatively lower than that, there was some, usually it was smarter to just buy the car. But now we have a really interesting new environment. And that is because the average cost of a car has bumped a psychological ceiling and pierced it. I talked about that in another video earlier, but really the cost of an automobile has, is reaching uh, historic highs as well. So now you have a historic peak in the shock value of the shopper who's going to shop for a new car. Secondly, they are buying something that may be the, in the top two or three most expensive items a person will ever purchase. The number one being their home. Number two, I think, is their vehicles. Okay, I'd have to throw in some other options depending on who you are. If you go to put a kid, child through college, woo, wow, that's a shock factor. So that will drop your automobiles to number three and four. But my point is, Buying a car is a very expensive endeavor. So now we can re-engineer this new idea. Does it make more sense to buy or lease? Awesome. So I want to begin with uh, a little quote that I found today on a site. It doesn't matter where I am because um, I, I'm not trying to endorse or unendorse or even write an opinion about any of these comments. I'm trying to find relevant uh, current information so that when we read these, these quotes and these headlines, it begins to make more and more sense as a prosperous soul. So here's the quote. Uh, I pick it up in the middle of a sentence and it, they make this assertion. Generally, I'm quoting, you will pay less each month than a person would to purchase the same car. Now the point is in this quote that a person will typically or generally pay less each month 
to lease versus to buy. Okay, well, I can't disagree with that, but we're going to uncover that a little deeper and realize how uh, kind of misleading that comment is if you are blind to the facts of how a lease versus buy works. At the end of today's video, I'll give you uh, my comments on, oh, this is how I shop a car, and uh, that's not necessarily wise, but I'll give you way, the way I think so you can push off of it and make your own super smart choices. All right. So here we go. Hey, let's pray real quick. Father in heaven, I'm asking for an anointed time to communicate truth and wisdom according to your ideas. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, before we move forward, I have to refer you back to context. A long time ago, last year in fact, when I began these Facebook Live uh, broadcasts, I introduced the idea of the difference between the way the wealthy think and the way the poor or middle class think. The wealthy think on the balance sheet. The poor and middle class think on the income statement. Both ways are valid but one is different because the wealthy have a different mindset. They make decisions with a different criteria than the poor and middle class who make their decisions on the income statement. Balance sheet versus income statement. This idea comes from a terrific author named Thomas Stanley, PhD. He wrote several books, but the two that I am most familiar with are The Millionaire Next Door and uh, the Millionaire Mind. Now he made several more books. I have not read those others. The one that I am referring to with the balance sheet versus income statement mindset comes from his book The Millionaire Mind. It's a terrific read and I highly recommend it to be an item on your bookshelf that you have gone through to discover the truth of how the wealthy think. One of his points is called balance sheet affluence versus income statement affluence. They're both affluent, but one thinks differently in terms of altitude, that's the balance sheet and the wealthy mindset, versus the way the other thinks, which is income statement, or how much can I afford to spend within my income. So incomes and outflows and outgoes, those are income statement oriented, but the balance sheet is how the wealthy think. So with this distinction, let's now look at an opening idea around uh, leasing. Now, like I said, the average price of an automobile, a new car in the United States has, has summited and broken through an artificial ceiling. That increased cost makes is creating a migration away from purchases of cars which de require debt and car loans into leasing. And the reason is because that migration lowers the income statement outflow. In other words, if I buy a car for $25,000, I have to round up either enough cash to go buy it or I put up a little cash, let's say a thousand dollars, 25 minus 1,000 equals 24,000 that I still have to find a way to buy. So I would go to a lender and borrow the rest. So in that case, I have the assignment to purchase a $25,000 vehicle. If I lease, I have a different scenario and this is how a lease actually works. You see, you take the value that you're buying, in my case, my example, $25,000, and then you subtract the value of that vehicle at the end of the lease. In other words, if I'm going to lease the car for three years, how much do we think that $25,000 car will be worth in three years? And let's say we think it's going to be worth 15,000 bucks after three years. Reasonable.
because if you take a high quality car and um, that car holds its value when it first leaves the lot it loses about 20 percent of its value but the loss or depreciation in that over time slows down so it's roughly typical that a car will have around 40 percent of its value after three years okay in this case fifteen thousand bucks well i've done my math wrong but work with me here i think that's about sixty percent of its value but let's keep going a twenty five thousand dollar car three years from now we think it's going to be worth fifteen thousand that means i have to lease the difference only ten thousand dollars 25 minus 15 equals 10 so the idea is that after for three years I can set up payments to pay back that ten thousand dollar decline and at the end of that three years I would turn in the car and get a new one depreciation or the decline over the time that I'm leasing so this becomes the big appeal how we can open with a statement like this that is true that you will generally pay less per month to lease than to purchase that same vehicle does that make sense I hope so okay well let's look at some further benefits of a lease number one we've already said is the lower monthly payments number two is that you will undoubtedly get into better and newer options in your car you know um, GPS and uh, those little backup lights and that thing where you can swing your foot underneath the back hatchback and it'll open its trunk and all those ideas all those cool things can be added and remain fresh in a lease so you are always driving a smoke and cool car which has some economic reality if you're a salesperson or you have an image to project that your clientele are expecting, it makes sense to show up in a nice vehicle rather than some old piece of garbage beater and they look at you like, wow, man, that's what you've got going on? That is a real economic decision to make. So I'm not minimizing that or ignoring that. I'm just saying those are the two top two benefits to a lease. The third, significantly, are tax savings. You see, if I bought the car for $25,000, in California, the average rate, depending on the county, is about 8% sales tax. When you lease, you don't have that. You avoid that. So that is significantly a cost savings for a lease. And then finally, you have the convenience. At the end of the lease, you literally drive your car to the dealership, walk away, and hold out your hand and say, give me the next uh, next cool vehicle so it's super convenient right you don't have to sell it you don't have to post it on uh, the Craigslist or any of those things you just there's no trade-in problems it's super easy all right those are the positives of leasing let's look at the negatives the negative is it is a lease is solely income statement affluent it is not looking at all on your balance sheet it's not trying to determine what is the value in this car that I am an owner. There is no equity in a leased vehicle. So if I am balance sheet affluent, leases become less appealing. Okay. Number two, uh, leases tend to have an, a little higher interest rate. Now they, when you lease a car, they don't, they don't tell you that. They say there's no interest involved because it's a lease, it's a rent. But the reality, the economic reality, is there is a interest rate imputed, in other words, hidden inside, that makes that lease an economic benefit for the leaseor. Realize the leaseor, the person leasing you the car, is in business, and they are not there to be friends. They're there to make a profit. So somehow they are making money on the rent of that, in our example, $10,000 spread over three years, there is a time value factor folded in so that the $10,000 collected over time is just as valuable 
as if they'd gotten it all at one time. That's a complicated idea. You can explore that later if you care. It's called the time value of money or the imputed interest of lease, of leasing. Just a couple side notes for those nerds among us that, like me, really want to, oh, how does that work? And oh, yeah. Frankly, I would say don't worry about it. But that's the two negatives. The third is that if you return your vehicle, remember how convenient it was? If you return it with either excessive miles or damage to the vehicle, you can actually end up owing money at the end because there are steep penalties for excessive miles or damage that needs to be repaired. They want the car returned in good, in, a, in the same condition it, that it left. So if you have damage, and or you have high mileage, let's say more than 12,000 miles in a year, it's all contractual, then when you turn it in, you might be surprised to have to write a check and go, ouch, and get rid of that beat up leased vehicle or that worn out leased vehicle. All right, fair enough. The last negative to a lease is that it is designed to always benefit the leaseor not to benefit the lessee. Okay, so this means that if I get a car, let's say instead of buying my $25,000 car, I decide to lease it on the difference, 25 minus its value at the end of 15 means I gotta lease $10,000 across this three year period and I set up a little lease payment and off I go. Well, if everything works perfectly, then at the end of the lease, I will give them back a car that is worth 15,000 bucks and I will owe nothing. My mileage is right, everything's perfect according to the, the, um, the contract. But how many know, raise your hand, that life is messy and unpredictable? Yeah, man, things just don't always go like we thought. So what happens is they, uh, if it comes in damaged or with high mileage, you pay the difference. There's your negative bite to protect the leaser, the company. If it goes the other way and you go, oh, I don't want to risk penalties, you will turn in a vehicle that has lower mileage and no damage, again, to the benefit of the leaser. You just didn't use your car as much as you had permission in your contract. So. Whether you use it lightly or heavily, you will pay the difference, not the lessor. You take the risk in a lease and it feels like you are not taking the risk. This is one of the masks behind this idea. Yes, you will pay less dollars per month for a lease than it would cost to buy. Can you see that? But realize you will never own anything. You are not building altitude. You are living on the income statement. Leasing is categorically off balance sheet financing. It's a way to leave the balance sheet and get on the income statement and lower your outlay. But it does never build altitude. Okay, so those are some ideas. Let me grab my paper. Oh, I dropped it on the floor. My big notes here. Okay. I uh, found there's lots of calculators to measure the specific details around your optional decision around whatever car you're thinking of. So in other words, there are places you can go on the internet that are free and you can drop in the values, the down payments, the interest rate, the length of time, all these facts can be laid into calculators. And one that I found that works very nicely is this one right here. Now I put it in the address, in the information part for this video, so you don't need to write this down, you can just look at the instructions. But bankrate.com is a very thorough lending and investing and commentary based website. Then they have calculators, so this you would all type in as one long explanation into 
your browser. Bankrate.com slash calculators slash auto. See how it's getting narrower? Slash lease by car dot ASPX. I don't know what that means, but I know there's a calculator on the other end of that. So go check that out and open all the little plus signs, all the little details, and make sure they haven't presumed some things. For example, if you start it presumed, I couldn't believe it. It was a trick on the site. It presumed a 28% sales tax. Now, maybe somewhere in the US that's true. New York City, maybe, I don't know. But that is miles away. And if you leave that embedded, because they give it to you hidden down inside, it will calculate, of course, a benefit to leasing will be cheaper to lease than to buy. Because with a sales tax so high, it's going to raise the cost to buy the car. But when you actually, and I proved this with my $25,000 example, if I put in what I believe is actually national average car interest, car loan interest rates, around 5%, and put in my state's sales tax on average, about 8%, it was more expensive to lease and cheaper to buy. Whoa! Little uh, alert there, little spoiler alert. Be sure you dig around in those calculators because remember, we're using a website who is designed to welcome you into their financing products. And there's nothing wrong with borrowing or leasing. But remember, I have a bias. I want to be the bank. I want to pay my self-interest, not a third-party banker. Okay, so this brings us to the last point, and this is going long, so I just want to talk through these last pieces. Okay, I wrote them out, and these are these are not official. These are just off the top, top of my head how I think when it comes to buying a car, because I hate buying cars, but I have bought bunches of them over the course of my lifetime. The first thing I do maintain. In other words, I probably have a car and the thing is probably pretty beat up and the thing is probably needing some help. Otherwise, I would not be in this environment to listen to this boring video and look at this face and go, why should I buy or lease? You wouldn't care, right? So something is happening with your vehicle. My point number one is I always maintain that car, man. I put money into my cars, even my old beaters, because I believe if you take care of it, it will take care of you. Now sometimes, and I've had some, you get yourself into a lemon. You get yourself an old car that doesn't pay to maintain. It's too expensive. But I've noticed this, people's tolerance to maintain is artificially low. It's like oh my gosh, it's going to cost me 75 bucks to replace the battery and I'm not doing that. I need a new car. That's ridiculous. It's going to cost me $400 for tires. I got to go have a new car. I'm not doing that. $400 into that old vehicle. Realize those things are going to be need to replace anyway. So what I do is I have a wider tolerance. Now for me, I understand about the value of my car. I'm driving an 18 year old pickup. Okay, that thing is not ugly. That thing runs every day. That thing stops when I need it to stop and starts when I need it to start. It's just a good vehicle. Yeah, 18 years old, but I've maintained it. Now, if the cost to maintain grows above 20% of its value, 20%, okay, that's a pretty big number. That's a $5,000, using my $25,000 example, that's a $5,000 repair. If it gets that high, I'll do it once. If it goes and it threatens to do it again, I'm gonna offload the car and go buy something different. So my, my percentages aren't my point. My point is widen your tolerance to maintain it. Number two, you want to be your own bank. So I begin to build 
with money that is not being used for maintenance, I point it at building a savings account for my next replacement. Does that make sense? I know my cars are going to wear out and I know I have to replace them so I set money aside even a little bit every month and it's building what? Altitude on my balance sheet and that is a balance sheet affluent mindset. So when the day comes, I'm the bank and I buy the car. The third item is quality and value. When it comes to the moment where I decide, yep, yeah, I'm going to go buy one and it's happened. I'm going to go out and buy a car. In fact, my son wrecked his car. Thankfully, years ago, he was in a bad accident, rolled the pickup. Thankfully, he was all healthy and good. But nonetheless, our car was destroyed. Well, his car that we were selling to him. He's a young man in college and living in another state or another part of the state of California. He was in Los Angeles. So we went out and we picked a car that we felt had a good quality that would last in years and that had value. In other words, I don't buy new cars. I buy cars that have already depressed out, pressed and squeezed out that new car, used car value fall. When you drive off the curb, when you leave the new car dealership and suddenly you're driving a used car and you watch 20% of your, of your money just vaporize, that's what I'm avoiding, okay? The last thing is debt. If I needed to borrow, and I did, to replace this car, what I did is I borrowed money. I went to the bank. I didn't have enough, but I had about, I think it was around $6,000. And we bought, I think it was about a $17,000 car at the time. So you can see, we put a relatively huge down payment. And then we borrowed the rest from the lender. Our credit is great because everybody loves us because we don't have a lot of debt, but the reality of it is we would not tolerate long-term debt to this lender. So we turned all our cannons in our financial, uh, the way our funnel works, the funnel refers back to an earlier video, and we pounded down that debt. And to my memory, I think we had it about seven months, six months maybe, and then we paid off the balance. So we are not, my wife, we, we are not anti-debt, we just will not tolerate it for long periods of time. To our best ability, God willing, we go after our debt like a chicken on a June bug, which is a cowboy's way of saying you don't let that thing hang around. You go after it and chew it up. And that's what we did. So those are kind of my thoughts. When it comes time to buy a car, after that assumes I have maintained what I've had and it's no longer maintainable. I have adequate savings and I have something for a down payment. I'm going to shop quality and value because I'm balance sheet minded. And finally, if I have to borrow, I will, but I will not do it and let it last for three years. I will blow that thing up, God willing, in months or weeks if possible. All right, that's all I have today. God bless you guys and God bless your prosperous souls. Cut. All right, we did it. So you guys can bail off if you need. I'm just going to look at see who showed up. Hello, Vicky from Hawaii. It's so fun to see you here, friend. Here's Andy. Thanks for jumping on, Andy. Hello, Andrew. It's so good to see you, my friend. God bless you. Here's Tatiana from Russia. Let's get this over here. Hey, Tatiana. I'm looking forward to maybe seeing you. Tatiana's in Moscow and uh, a good friend. And uh, I'm on my way to England and Moscow, which makes me remember to just mention, I may be sketchy over the next month with my Facebook Lives, okay? I'm in all different countries and I'm traveling really hard with Donna. And so, man, if I miss something, sorry, I'll do my best to record and post it, but who knows where we're going to be in the next couple weeks. Here is Christina. Hello, girl. Good to have you. And little Lisa. Hi, Lisa, my friend. Give your hubby a hello. Give Stephen a hello for me. Hello, Ryan. 
Oh, Ryan Nicky Perez. It's fun. I'd like to meet you. Uh, Robert Farns. Hello, Robert. Great to have you. And uh, oh, Robert's in England because he says he'll see me this week in Bradford. That's my first stop. My wife and I leave early morning tomorrow, which is a Tuesday here in the U.S., and we will fly to across the pond and visit our good friends there in the U.K. I've got a lot of them in Bradford and New Hampton and Bath and many places over there. And Wolverhampton, I'll be in there. Uh, let's see, where else am I going? I'm going to Wrexham. Uh, I'm going... Uh, Another place I've not heard of before, Tadsworth. So I think I said that right. So that'll be a new place. We're doing prosperous souls and prosperous homes and sozo trainings for Donna all over uh, our country, the UK, our friends there. And then I fly from there into Moscow, Krusnyarsk, Bisk, back to Moscow. And during that, they are going to work as hard, man. So both the eastern and western side, that would put us squarely in Siberia on the east and Moscow on the west. So I'm excited to see my, my friends in Russia, and I have a lot over there as well. I appreciate Robert. He just greeted me and said, safe travels. I receive it gratefully. God bless you guys. I'm going to take off. And Father, prosper my friends, whoever's in this page, that they would they would grow and see and taste the increase from your kingdom come. I pray for their capacity in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. God bless you, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks for watching. I'm Stephen K. De Silva, and you're probably wondering, why have I never heard this information before? Well, now you can by going up into this corner and subscribing to this channel. Or you can go to this corner and watch the next video. There is tons of information I'm giving you. Go check it out and go deeper. Or better yet, go to the link below and go check out my website. I've got some free stuff on there. Go get that and go see lots of resources so you can finally master your money. Hey, I gotta go record another video. I'll see you soon, bye.